Welcome to the Hidden History Happy Hour podcast with Alex Dean and Brian Cunningham. Here we have a drink, have a laugh, and you just might learn something about our favorite stories from history. Please visit our website at hiddenhistoryhappyhour.com and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you like the show, please rate us five stars and leave a review. Cheers. Welcome back, dear listeners, to Hidden History Happy Hour with Alex and Brian, where we have a drink, have a laugh, and maybe you just might learn something, and where we enjoy a beverage or two after the fashion of the subjects of our stories. Alex Dean, what are we enjoying today? Uh, We are going to have some bourbon. Yes, we are. And why? Well, you're going to have to stick around to find out, listeners. Today on our special President's Day episode, and by that, of course, I mean United States of America presidents, Alex. Alex and I will be quaffing bourbon, despite the fact that our main subject, one Abraham Lincoln, who you might have heard of, spoke out about the evils of intemperance in a very famous speech in 1942, not 1942, pretty sure that wasn't Abraham Lincoln's year, 1842. And I didn't realize until I was researching this episode that temperance was a real political issue in the politics all across the United States of America, even as early as the 1840s. So Abraham Lincoln had spoken out in a famous speech about the evils and temperance. On the other hand, Abe was literally born into the liquor business. Abraham Lincoln's father worked at a distillery, likely making the very whiskey bourbon that Alex and I, and hopefully listeners, if you're doing it responsibly, are enjoying as well. And get this, Abraham Lincoln's family literally lived along Knob Creek. Knob Creek. That's great. And why does this relate to our second subject? Not an endorsement. Yeah, No, not an endorsement. Unless, you know, if you guys want to sponsor us, that's great. Uh, Another reason why we're drinking bourbon is because of our second subject on President's Day week, Lyndon Baines Johnson but you'll have to stick around to find out why. Alex, tell us about Abraham Lincoln's duel. I will. Well, first, you put me on the spot uh, last time. I'm going to return with an open question, uh, which is an, always a, an interesting game, and I don't think there's any right answer, but Abraham Lincoln, your greatest president? Yes or no? I don't know how you can't say George Washington is our greatest president, but it's, uh, as Aaron Sorkin would say, it's six to five and pick em. And pick him. Yeah, of course, Washington, who reigned, was treated like a king and was invited to stay on and, and declined it, uh, to, and thereby creating your, uh, your tradition of uh, two terms. I say tradition because it was then, of course, breached by uh, FDR and became law. But at that time, he created that, that precedent. And, um, and as, as you, you, you wanted to make him king for life. As usual, Alex, you nailed it. This is this is of the many achievements that George Washington had. And by the way, he wasn't free of mistake. His early military career was actually quite disastrous. And there were moments in the American Revolution, if you have seen Hamilton, that you'll know could have gone terribly wrong. But I think, honestly, his greatest moment was when he declined to be the king of the United States of America. And he put in motion the presumption that we don't have someone ruling us forever. Well, you say that, but of course, in the United Kingdom, we've been enjoying strong female leadership since 1952, and we're just waiting for you guys to catch up. So, you know, there are, <laughs> six to five and pick them. I have uh, no retort now. to that, except we need the right candidate. <laughs> Understood. Uh, we're going to talk about Lincoln, and a lot of people don't know that he fought a duel, or rather he didn't in the end, but it, <laughs> it's better if I start saying that, that, that he did. And... Um, Before he was uh, president, Lincoln was, of course, famously a prairie lawyer and a good one. Self-described. But he was indeed. uh, But also he was a politician and uh, he was a a middlingly successful politician for a while. He was busy uh, in and around Illinois. And in 1842, funnily enough, the year you were just talking about in 1842, um, uh, the Illinois State Bank um, put a lot of the holders of its notes in jeopardy when it closed. Tempers running high in the state, um, accusations made uh, against the state auditor, one James Shields, um, and Lincoln attacked him in the press, as was the the fashion at the time. First of all, under a pseudonym, but very swiftly revealed in his own name. And 
uh, Shields um, is abusive towards Lincoln. Lincoln's demands he retracts. He doesn't. Handbags so far, goes to to and fro. And in the end, Shields calls him out. Now, dueling is not legal in Illinois in 1842, but it is legal in Missouri. Show me. Uh, Exactly, exactly, the show me state. So uh, as he's the one that's challenged, and as I think we can uh, gather from the way he behaved afterwards, he didn't really want to fight the duel. Link, so Lincoln gets, to, he's the one that's challenged. He gets to choose the weapons and he gets to choose the place in which the duel is fought. Uh, it gives us one of history's great replies to being called out, a great reply to anything. Yes, sir. The answer is, I choose broadswords in a pit. <laughs> I'm so trying to find a way to use that in my daily life. Yeah, broadswords in a pit, uh, please. Standard Tuesday for Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> um, the, the, the phrase itself is electrifying. Yes. Um, so Lincoln explained uh, afterwards uh, in, in writing, I think, but certainly when he was being asked about it, that he felt sure that Shields would kill him if, they, if he chose pistols. A- and he wasn't keen on being killed. No. And he also wasn't keen, actually, on killing Shields. Apart from anything else, it might rather stymie your political career if you are named to be someone who goes around killing uh, your adversaries. Particularly you think, with you a mentioned sword. Hamilton. Exactly. You mentioned Hamilton already. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Dueling was a thing in your political class, and it, it led to a clear diminution of the talent pool. Fairly and Lincoln sure was... we learned it from you guys, but go ahead. Well, I'm just pointing out that there's a, a great musical about <laughs> uh, about how American uh, presidents can we were can we at drop least one a great candidate? Can we drop a footnote about Hamilton just oh, real quick? Always, always. So I've seen Hamilton three times. I have two daughters. They're both, as you know, Alex, in the musical theater, different occasions. They're very Thank moved you. by Hamilton, which is amazing because they really didn't care about history at all. But I went to see Hamilton in the West End. And actually, Alex Dean, I'm just literally thinking of this right now. This might have been the last time I saw you before COVID. I was You're in great. London and I went to the West End and I saw Hamilton. And they don't laugh at the same places that we laugh at in New York. No. <laughs> uh, they, I mean, they certainly laugh. at. I mean, the king is still a funny character. Yeah, but uh, it's like a the- little golf clap instead of a massive uproar. Sure, but we laugh knowingly at I'll send an armed battalion to remind you of my love. <laughs> I think that's that's a superb line. The great, uh, the great genius. This is a whole other episode, but part of the genius of that entire work of art, Hamilton, is how he reconceptualizes things into different and totally unpredictable genres. Reimagining right. the American Revolution in a 1960s girl group breakup song is second only to representing the long-running, very vitriolic cabinet debates between Jefferson and Hamilton as rap fight-offs. Right. Right, we're going to get back to Lincoln. I digress, yes. Yeah, you, you indeed. So um, he wasn't keen on being killed. He wasn't keen on ki- killing Shields. Uh, and so he chose large, heavy swords and thinking he could disarm his smaller um, uh, opponent much smaller shields right? indeed shields accepts the terms uh half of illinois promptly to camps to missouri to watch the fun <laughs> for the fight of the decade so as you say lincoln six foot four and famously strong and famously long arms mm-hmm. shields five foot nine um and as they entered the arena of battle lincoln held out his sword at the extent of uh, his reach and whacked a tree and he whacked it hard enough to take a branch off. And uh, Shields thought, well, I'm not really going to get near this guy. <laughs> and uh, the branch you know, broken in two shows he's pretty strong. I'm not really sure about this dueling <laughs> business after all, Mr. Lincoln. I think we might be able to call a oh, no, on reflection. I think we might be able to uh, call a truce. Uh, it's two things, interesting things about it. Lincoln was, it was a man deeply committed, almost ostentatiously committed to honesty. And he never denied the truthfulness of the fact that that episode happened, that he'd, you know, besmirched Shields' name in the press, including you using a pseudonym, that he'd agreed to fight a duel and, and so forth. He, but he hated, he hated to talk about it. And I like to think that that's because he thought the whole thing was rather dishonorable mm-hmm. and certainly not to be admired. And I think that's a good attitude to have about about fighting in order to fix your your problems. And then secondly, later in the Civil War, 
Shields acquitted himself admirably as a leader of fighting men for the Union. And Lincoln, as his president, of course, nominated Shields for a promotion. So, you know, any remaining rift between those men was mended by duty. I think that's a, a lovely thing to know. Can you imagine politicians in the United States, and if you want to opine in, in Britain in 2022, ever doing something as peacemaking and forgiving and magnanimous as Abraham Lincoln did with uh, Shields? Well, uh, had Shields persisted in his belligerence, he probably would have taken his head off. So uh, no, I'm, talking about the the promotion. I'm talking about the promotion. Oh, the promotion. Sorry. Um, I think that I can, and it just may not be the people you're thinking about doing it. I know plenty of honourable people. I, I know fewer politicians on your side of the pond. I know some, I know a lot of politicians on my side. I can think of a number of people who would aspire to a team of rivals, you know, would aspire to appoint those who had done well against them and put them into office, not in the hope of undermining them or keeping them inside the tent rather than out, but in the belief that the right thing to do is to have a government of all the talents. Now, they may not be the people that you immediately spring to mind when you think of leading politicians, but I can think of those people. Well, let me be more specific as we go on the air at President's Day time in 2022. Could you imagine Kevin McCarthy putting Liz Cheney back in leadership when he's the speaker because of her courage in this moment? That is a framed and loaded question. Yes, it is. Uh, in That's which my you, favorite you, kind. You set out, you set out <laughs> the fact that one must, one must implicitly admire uh, what Liz Cheney uh, is doing in order to um, be able to answer it on your terms. And I, I don't express a view either way on, on what uh, Cheney's stance is, but I, Kevin McCarthy is one I do know. And I, I think that the answer to your question is no. I do not think that Kevin McCarthy could do that in the House. On the other hand, now, on the other hand, I can well imagine a scenario in which President McCarthy, one day, looking out at the... Uh, talent pool available to him appoints someone like her or her himself to his cabinet. So um, it's a long way around of, of saying, actually, I, I think I can in, envisage that. Bear in mind, Lincoln didn't promote Shields the next day. Fair enough. You know, he didn't say, right. Well, he couldn't have fight. because he was an obscure congressman, but understood. But, you, yeah. Were it in his power? I yeah, think yeah. it was actually before he was a congressman. And he, he, was, maybe he was in the Illinois State House for some time. Uh, that's why, by the way, that's why the... Um, Illinois capital moved to Springfield. Yes, uh, which is because it used to be in Vandalia. Am I, am I saying that right? Uh, uh, that sounds right. Sure. Um, yeah, and um, and Lincoln demonstrating that a small, concentrated minority will normally prevail over a diffuse majority. Got together a few of his friends and they lobbied vociferously to move the state capital, where it remains to this day. Yes, sir. And just while we're on that, how do you compare the British? lack of civility or actual civility in politics today versus what's happening in my country? Good question. I think it's driven, interestingly, by the uh, close-knit adversarial nature of of, our, of the House. I, don't, I mean, physically, you know, House of Commons is a place in which people are, are you know, two swords lengths apart and are baying at each For other. For a good reason. Um, Yep. <laughs> and are baying at each other uh, constantly. And I think that it, in part affects it. And I think that we have a long tradition of true oppositional politics in its most aggressive sense. That is that you you test um, you test ideology and you test theory by thumping things against each other as hard as you can. And, you know, I'll do my very damnedest to do your policy down. And only if it survives that onslaught will it go forth to become policy. And in fact, on that view, it's my duty to hit as hard as I Oil can. Opposition. It's, my res it's my responsibility to hammer you as hard as I can. I don't have a problem particularly with that uh, um, with that bit relationship between politicians being aggressive. The problem I have with politics today is different. I have a problem with the corrosive attitudes towards politicians per se. Mm -hmm. I think we've got into a deeply corrosive environment in which we people say too much and think too easily. They're all at it. They're all on the make. They're all bad. They're all wrong. And that's just that it just ain't so. There are plenty of people who go into public life to do public service. And it, yeah, it's very difficult that what you were asking me whether I could imagine a potential scenario 
scenario. The hard thing to do is to imagine people looking up to a modern day politician like people looked up to Lincoln. That's the change. That's what's difficult to do because we don't really believe in heroes in politics anymore. And certainly we, if we do think they're theoretically possible, we don't treat anyone today as if they are one. And someday we'll discuss whether we blame the media for that or we blame ourselves. To, you know, there's, there's this Greg Lake Christmas song where he says the Christmas we get, we deserve. And part right. of my theory, having been in politics and government now for almost half a century, is we get the elected officials we deserve. But that's for another day. Let's get back to Honest Abe. Alex, do you have any idea why Abraham Lincoln decided to publish the letter that led to his duel with Mr. Shields as, quote, Rebecca, close quote? Uh, I think it's one of those things that I did read in the course of researching the book and have forgotten but i have a strange sense that you're going to enlighten me actually i don't know we might fill that in later. ah damn <laughs> <laughs> but also relatedly apparently he goaded his opponent shields by publicly ridiculing him for not being able to marry all the girls he was seducing telling him telling the girls shields telling the girls quote it is not my fault that i'm so handsome and so interesting and now let me revise and extend my early reports my earlier uh, comments, as are we. Indeed. All right. So the Civil War episode for this that you just mentioned is President Lincoln promoting Brigadier General Shields to Major General. Do we think that proves that time actually does heal all wounds? Do we think there were other political tactical reasons? Why did he do that? I think it's well, I, in that example, I genuinely think it was because um, enough time had gone past and he'd seen a man do his duty well. I don't think that time heals all wounds. I think that there are some um, rivalries that people find it impossible to give up within themselves. I would say time can heal all, all wounds. It can, doesn't time always. can potentially heal all wounds, but it doesn't always. Yeah. And uh, in that example, you know, I thought that it's very interesting the way that the leadership of the South was treated mm -hmm. by um, those to whom they surrendered with great dignity, rather different, but I, I might point out to the rank and file and the way that they mm -hmm. uh, got along in, in life after, but the, the leadership uh, were treated with great dignity um, by the leaders of the union when they um, surrendered. And um, sometimes it's easier to be, uh, decent to the opposition than it is to your rivals on your own side. And that we do see in modern politics. Well, we will undoubtedly revisit the issue many times of how the vanquished treat the victors and vice versa. But I will note that there's an American television series out now called 1883, which is a follow-on series to this ridiculously shockingly popular show called Yellowstone with Kevin Costner and the opening sequence of which is uh, American country singer and actor Tim McGraw plays a civil war veteran who becomes a frontiersman. The right. opening scene, he's the last survivor of a major civil war battle fighting on the side of the Confederacy and the union general and all of his troops roll into the camp. And he's literally sitting there like in PTSD is what we would say now on a stump and the commanding general of the union forces comes up to him, sits down next to him on the stump, shares a drink might be a theme here and comforts him and tries to escort him into the future. And much to my shock, that general is played by American treasure, Tom Hanks. I'm watching this. I'm saying that sucks. That looks just like American treasure, Tom Hanks, but they're obviously got a cheap imitator. Turns out Tim McGraw, close friends with Tom Hanks. He actually makes a cameo in the episode, which is that's cool. Apropos of nothing, I except I hope it's researched enough to indicate that on occasion, the victors, treated the vanquished well with decency and with honor and indeed that's at the heart of the very first story i told uh, that kicked off uh, the book that led to a 
um, a Frenchman sitting on the throne in Sweden, which is occupied by the House of Bernadotte to, to this day, uh, treating the vanquished well. But it's a great story, and but it's completely believable, Brian, because your civil war divided brother and brother, divided literally, uh, divided father and son, and um, I people. It was inevitable that you that some were able to feel humanity uh, to a hated enemy, even if others couldn't. Yeah. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to Lyndon Baines Johnson, who is memorialized in so many works, but in, in, also in your book, Lessons from History. And Lyndon Baines Johnson was obviously uh, president of the United States uh, during the 60s, and he uh, succeeded uh, John F. Kennedy as president after the tragic assassination of JFK. But what some people who may not have studied this as much realize is he was a far more established politician than Kennedy. LBJ had been elected to Congress in the deepest parts of the depression and reelected and reelected and then became a leader in Congress and elected to the Senate and then became the leader of the Senate. And I think the stories that are in your book, lessons from history tell us a lot about the humanity of the man, which is, which is really important. And we forget that like history, you know, you read the plaque and it says what they did and it says when they did it, it doesn't tell you much of anything about the man or the woman or in the future, the non-binary person who did the thing that's being recorded. So right. I would like to recount a couple of your stories, if you'll permit me, from your book about LBJ. But as in Alex's great book, Lessons from History, there's a trigger warning here. Yeah, <laughs> Lyndon Baines Johnson, first of all, was from Texas. Second of all, he was from Texas in the 20s and 30s, so 100 plus years ago. And third, I don't know if I can compare him to everyone in history, but it was about as profane as they come in American history. So he some of these, mouth, that's for sure. Yes, sir. So some of these stories bear with us. Try not to suffer microaggressions. If you do, you know, get some counseling. First story I want to tell is actually not in Alex's book, because part of what we are trying to do here is give the many, many tens of thousands of people who have loved Alex's Twitter feed and Alex's book, Lessons from History, some new shit. We don't right. want them to say, why am I tuning in to hear these same stories I've heard a million times? I mean, you could argue our banter is worth it by itself, but let's not rely on that. We're going to add some new stories. And so this story about Lincoln, which is not in Alex's book, is called Bourbon and Branch Water with LBJ. Turns out a young Air Force major and White House fellow was in his first month as a White House fellow uh, during the early, early days of LBJ's presidency. He was working for the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, who sent him to an Oval Office meeting to take notes uh, at a discussion between Johnson and his most trusted foreign policy advisors about the Vietnam War, which at this point was in full swing, and also to discuss the United States response to an insurrection within South Vietnam's leadership and to select literally, literally any veterans out there who want to think about this in the Oval Office, select individual bombing targets in North yep. Vietnam. And I'm sure Alex and I will have much discussion in the future about the wisdom of that, but that's how it was at this point in American history. So the young major, you know, like, 17 rungs below the commander in chief is sitting in this meeting in the Oval Office, taking notes so he can give his boss, the Secretary of State, a proper briefing on this vital meeting. Meeting ends. He's the junior officer in the room, which means protocol determined that he was the last to leave the Oval Office. As he's leaving the Oval Office, LBJ taps him on the shoulder and says, son, would you like to have a bourbon and branch water? Now, this guy doesn't know what branch water is. Arguably doesn't even know what bourbon is, but he figures the commander in chief asked me to stay for a drink. I'm staying for a drink. So right. drinks in hand, 
they settle onto the sofa in the Oval Office and they just chat for an hour or so. As the major is about to congratulate the president on his fine taste in bourbon, he looks up to LBJ and he sees that LBJ's eyes are tearing up. So the young major says, Mr. President, I might not have realized the gravity of the situation we discussed in this meeting and the serious decisions that you have to make. Johnson says to him, no. And now I'm quoting from the book, which will break the show notes. No, that's not it. Quote, I am very sad right now because this is still Jack Kennedy's house. Jack had the charm. He was witty and handsome. And here I am just a poor Texas school teacher and dirt farmer. Since we got back from Dallas. So now you understand the time frame of this. Since we right. got back from Dallas, the only one who has ever accepted me here at the white house is lady bird Johnson. Now, this is LBJ later in life, broken by his own possibly irrational feelings of inadequacy in following John Fitzgerald Kennedy and his perceived lack of love from the American people. It's a sad, sad moment, right? It's a, it's a powerful story. But uh, go ahead, Alex. No, I just got to say, um, it's, he was a man of great pomp ceremony and character and perhaps with the you know only if you have been on the highest mountain top can you know what it or if you've been in the deepest valley yes sir. can you know what it is to be on the highest mountain and i and i think this also speaks to what i've observed in my own political career and life and maybe you have too which is sometimes the person you're going to confide in the most is the bartender that you've never met it's the cab driver right. that you've never met it's or sometimes it's the enemy that you vanquished right so but, famously um jfk asked nixon for advice uh you know where where do i go on this thing yeah is there only so many people that understand it yeah yeah well that's i mean there's a running motif in american history about the and i'm sure british too about the president's club about you know Sure. George course, w at, that point, at, at that point, Nixon hadn't been president. He'd been Ike's ah, yes, vice president. Fair enough. But, you know, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton are famous friends now. And yeah. Trump is the outlier. We'll talk about that in a future episode. But most presidents understand that they're the only ones that know. Right. And, you know, you chided me a bit ago about a woman president. I hope we have one soon. I hope it's the right one. I don't think we've ever nominated the right one so far. Um, but it'll be women, you know, it'll be transgender, it'll be non-binary people uh, in the future, but we're not doing a future podcast, we're doing a history podcast. A history podcast. So let right. me refer back to LBJ, because the story I just told was later in life when he was kind of broken. The rest of them are just full-on, undistilled, <laughs> 200 proof LBJ. All right. Uh, and I realize as you uh, it set that up uh, that um, what at least one of these stories I originally had from you years ago. Mm. Uh, and as you were talking, I checked the uh, I checked my acknowledgments and I did not acknowledge you. Yeah, so I'd like to hereby acknowledge you, Brian, for at least one of these stories. Oh, this is com uh, this is coming up, my friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, good, good. You know, actually, on one view, it's better this way. On one view, it's better. On a yes, sir. Um, so. Uh, le not not fruity, but fascinating is is this one to me. I think people often go back into the biographies of politicians to try to work out where they were coming from and what their behaviour was going to be like. And arguably, of course, LBJ's greatest moments uh, is, uh, as Caro records in his magisterial yes, biographies, um, Four volumes, is right? what master of the Senate. Yeah, is when he was really bossing, running the Senate. And you want and it knew everyone and had that strange way of grabbing people and getting close to them and really physicality and controlling things with his presence. I think mean, how did you develop that? And how did you get towards that? And how did you that that club ability that you fostered? Caro writes in his book that LBJ brushed his teeth five times in the morning and five times at night, whilst whilst he was at university, so that he could 
accidentally meets everyone yes. on his corridor. And you have the quiet word, say how you're doing, have that, just get into that moment. And um, how calculating would you have to be as a student to, to <laughs> foresee that you're going to be that political, small p political, and you're going to, you know, behave in that in that way to woo people? I thought it was I thought it was really revealing thing about somebody well uh, first of all i'm so glad you mentioned that because that's the one story from your book lessons from history that i'm going to leave out so i'm glad you included that but secondly this was bill clinton right like bill clinton american president william jefferson clinton for anybody who doesn't remember other than he's the wife of hillary i mean he his husband, entire really husband yeah, his in, yes husband his entire mo was just relationship building and right. relatedly, uh, and I know we're going to get to this in a future episode because you tell a few stories about George H.W. Bush, or as we call him, 41, the 41st president. He famously wrote handwritten thank you notes to yeah. hundreds of people every year. And yeah. I've always wanted to emulate that. And I never have, because honestly, I don't care that much about people. But you're right. I mean, that's those retail politics skills are invaluable. Are there British politicians that have had that recently? Um, I, in the same way, not quite. I can think of plenty of people who have that in their constituency and they're good kind of grassrootsy, you know, work the patch politicians. But in that in that way that, you know, Clinton got a surprise result in the New Hampshire primaries when he was running for office. And when people were work, doing the research in the field afterwards as to why that happened, a remarkable percentage of people said that actually met him. 100%. Like cr 100%. Crazy number of people. So our listeners may or may not know that I was a graduate of the Iowa Fiction Workshop. And after I graduated, because that degree was completely valueless, I signed on to a United States Senate campaign in Iowa, and this was 1984, and uh, part of what was going on was the presidential campaign, and Cl Clinton wasn't involved, but the perception of people in uh, the U.S. state of Iowa and the U.S. state of New Hampshire, who have respectively the first caucus and the first primary, that if I haven't met the person, I'm not voting for them. Right. That is overwhelming. That's fine. Like they so just that won't do it. Re Reagan's real. Uh, I hesitate to ask which side you were on. Uh, Reagan's re-election was 1984. Was 84. Yes, yeah. I was on the wrong side of that. And I will acknowledge it. I will say this. Uh, I grew up in Ohio, small town. Yeah. My mom grew up in Kansas, hardcore Republican. She thought that Roosevelt's you, name... You had a little was rebellion against this she thought roosevelt's name was franklin goddamn roosevelt my dad <laughs> episcopal minister which is going to come up in a future show very left wing had martin luther king uh, at his church in 1962 when that most certainly wasn't cool in uh white uh rich ohio he was on the far left they never agreed on anything i just kind of like picked the person i thought would do a good job all along i've never been partisan i've never been that nope. ideological it's uh you've had a long time to explain that mistake so you've, you've <laughs> you do it very well but when you tell that story you do it very well i tell a couple more lbj uh, anecdotes and you gave a trigger warning this one's especially profane uh lg bay LG, lbj says to his uh, press officer of, of an opponent in an election son i want you to go out and say he fucks pigs uh -huh. uh, and his aide says yeah, but sir he doesn't fuck pigs. And LBJ says, well, sure, son, but uh, I want to hear the son of a bitch deny it. <laughs> so <laughs> so first of all, thanks for stepping on my story. Second of all, uh, this is a perfect introduction to American politics over the last, I guess now I'd have to say 60 years because LBJ wasn't the first person to pull this shit. Watched again, the movie Hamilton, but he certainly made it an art form and James Carville, who's going to be in our, on our show in the future and uh, generations of political consultants have done the same thing. And by the right. way, the most recent horrible example, which actually I think tragically turned American history uh, the wrong way is in the 2012 election when Harry Reid went on the Senate floor and 
implied, I'm being polite, that Mitt Romney hadn't paid his taxes. Harry Reid admitted later in life, and unfortunately he just died in the last month, that he had no evidence whatsoever about that. He just fucking made it up and said it. So LBJ, either depending on how you look at it, continued a tradition or maybe like accelerated tradition. But can I tell two other stories about LBJ? Go go for it, Art, but except my footnote is that the Reid... Uh, accusation is a classic example of how in politics it's much easier to throw an accusation than to rebut it thousand it's percent much, it's much harder to give a regional reasonable rational response to an emotional argument and when you he picked the right target it may have been an unfair accusation but he picked the right target because if you're very wealthy and your tax affair is a complex then your answer to did you pay your taxes is not straightforward it will be. I did in the following way. And what you might think of as minimizing taxation or even evading it is not uh, is not so. There was a clever thing. It was a clever underhand thing to do. Well, let me ask you this, Alex Dean. You obviously admire Harry Reid's tradecraft. I, I do not. I do not. I was just exp- putting the, the point. Do you think that what he did was, in the words of our Australian brothers, fair drinkum? No, I don't. So you condemn it, but you recognize the value of it. I recognize uh, the power of it. Okay, fair. Fair enough. All right, so let me get back to LBJ for a second. Yeah. So in your book, you tell the story of, and I'm, I'm adding this as a, as a title, My Helicopters. Sure. We all recall that LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, assumed the presidency hours after John F. Kennedy's tragic association, uh, <laughs> assassination. assassination, John F. Kennedy's tragic assassination. Despite, and we should talk about this, because I would say in parentheses, or perhaps because of the gravity of the moment, newly minted President Johnson is reported to have quipped as follows. Uh, perhaps his braggadocio, perhaps to diffuse the tension, both of which history shows he was particularly good at. He said to a young officer who just helpfully pointed out, this is within hours of him being president, said, Mr. President, over there, those are your helicopters. Johnson says, son, they're all my helicopters. That's in your book. You researched it. Do you think he was, what do you think his motives were for saying that? The unkind thing about history and great office is that it will remember moments that are beneath you. Yeah. And in fact, it'll sort of quite often Magnify. seek them out. Yeah. Seek them out. And people are people who give a lifetime of public service can have their reputation undone by one careless slip, which is mm-hmm. remembered. Uh, we had a perfectly a bit, bit slightly inadequate but we had a perfectly reasonable politician in the uk who struggled for some reason on camera to eat a sandwich and that was him done his inability to eat a bacon sandwich was him finished this is mike Dukakis wearing the tank helmet that sort of it was yeah you're too you know it's okay if i disagree with you it might even like margaret thatcher be okay if i hate you but if I laugh at you, yeah, if I can't take you done. seriously. You're done. Yeah. And LBJ was never that character. No. He was always a st- remarkably strong man. But I think within it, there was, a, there was an element of huge hubris and, uh, and ambition and oh, of burning course. ambition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that popped out in that, in that quote. Uh, and I have little doubt the carrier biographies demonstrate sometimes something is is true even if it's not true yes sir you know i i believe that quote to be true but even if it isn't it's so true of the character of the man in those moments it accurately it well captured the moment yes sir yeah so let's move on to story number two which is also in your book and i believe this is the one that i told you so we should note at the beginning of this that this is particularly timely given um that we're in the, in the United States of America debating voter access and equity. So this is a story that occurred uh, when uh, LBJ was running for re-election to Congress. So it was probably the 30s or late 20s, probably the 30s. And <laughs> as was the fashion in, and I will confess, mostly Democratic politics at the time, they would vote dead people. So they would create ballots for people who were deceased and they'd file them in the county election, uh, you know, boxes. 
So the story, which is amazing, just, I don't even care if it's true. It's just amazing. But I also <laughs> think it's true is Johnson running for re-election for Congress is walking through a graveyard with his aides, writing down names of people that they will then vote in the next election. And his staff, you know, it's late at night, it's two in the morning, whatever, it's raining, it's muddy. And they say, you know, they walk past a, a, a gravestone without writing down the name. And Johnson accosts them and says, why aren't you writing down that name? And they say, well, you know, like it's late at night, it's muddy, we got plenty of people. Johnson says, boy, that man has as much right to vote as anyone else in this cemetery. <laughs> you know, not only do I love it, I, I was telling the story as you were going along. I must have told that story a hundred times uh, and I owe it to you. So it's a great one to finish this episode. I think, I is think there, that's a Alex, uh, fantastic. Is, is there any history of that in the UK? No, not in anything like the same way. Uh, um, for, weirdly, we do have our own tradition of um, the manipulation of, of of the identity of the dead, but it's for committing crimes. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. so, so famously- And, and Alex, Frederick you were Forsyth, a defense lawyer in the prior life, right? Yeah, yeah. And I've never had someone, as far as I know, who pulled this trick, but uh, Frederick, Freddie Forsyth famously wrote in The Day of the Jackal uh, of an assassin who yep. assumes the, the, the identity of, a, of a, a dead child whose name he finds in the graveyard. Yes. That was not only happening when The Day of the Jackal was made, great, great movie and a great book, yep. uh, it was happening until very recently. Fred, 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 Fred well, so I still gets interviewed by people saying, gosh, this thing's happened in you know, 2012, 2013. So, um, so yeah, we're not, not for the manipulation of the electoral role in, in the same way. The accusation in the UK is the manipulation of postal votes, that people, you know, get together and, and, and vote on behalf of others by, by uh, abusing postal votes. Well, let me finish episode two with a couple more thoughts about LBJ. LBJ once said, quote, we can draw lessons from the past, but we cannot live in it, close quote. So dear readers, you got to be picking and choosing what you're going to take away from these podcasts. But right. LBJ also said, quote, books and ideas are the most effective weapons against intolerance and ignorance close quote hey there's no jokes there there's just a lesson no i powerfully believe that and alex, I, I believe that that was true and alex dean you know who else felt that way about reading and writing and ideas saint patrick but our le our listeners are going to have to wait until next month for that story thank you for listening to the hidden history happy hour podcast don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you have questions, comments, or suggestions for topics, you can find us on Twitter or on our website, hiddenhistoryhappyhour.com. We look forward to joining you next time. We thank our gifted producers, Jeremy Corr and Kate Cruz, and our visionary executive producer, Ivan Williams, without whom this podcast would be, well, history. And thanks also to our art designer, David Wardle. Cheers. Cheers.